Okay, everybody, for all my Facebook Live people and people that are getting on Zoom to check this out. This is my second Denveronomics for 2022. I've been doing this for, gosh, about eight or nine years. Um, how it all started was, it was January of 2007, and I, I follow the economy. I'm more of a math and economic person than anything. And January of 07, I recognized the fact that we were going to go into not just a regular recession, but a great recession because of, you know, just bad lending practices. There wasn't enough regulation around our lending laws. We had people who did not have consistent income by multiple houses, and, and there was a bubble that was created. I think this Demonomics is probably going to be more important to everybody right now because we are hearing so many buzzwords in uh, basically you pull up your news feed, you know, watch the news. I mean, talk to your Uber driver. It's, it's crazy. Everybody has a comment. Everybody's talking about the Federal Reserve, right? I mean, when, when common folk are talking about the Federal Reserve, it makes you think, you know, is, is this another 2008, 2009 recession? And so, you know, it was an important time for me to do this and to kind of give you some facts of what is actually happening, because um, I don't think we get empirical data whatsoever from our media sources. And it doesn't matter if you're CNN or Fox or MSNBC, like it is um, basically they're just trying to sell headlines and they're trying to get people to watch the television to sell ads. And so what you have to realize is you have to be able to cut through the noise and actually look at facts. So, uh, what we're going to go over is global updates, um, the U.S. updates, what's happening with home buying, then we're going to do crime in Colorado and in Denver specifically, and the impact of inflation. So, why do we do these seminars? Um, I think so many people just kind of live through life and they don't have a plan. And so, you know, this is a great stat. 82% of Americans have no ability to retire. And, you know, that number is actually going to get worse because we're having such bad inflation. So our elderly who are on Social Security are really feeling the impacts because they don't work or don't have active income from work and they're just receiving Social Security and they're depending on that to pay for their retirement and it's getting squeezed heavily. So global updates, wow, it's a mess everywhere, right? Uh, Putin is still raging war against Ukraine. Ukraine is literally the bed basket of Europe. Uh, they, they produce steel, they produce food, lots of food. We already have uh, not enough food for China or India because of what Russia has done to Ukraine. Um, I don't know a single person who is pro-Russia and who's against Ukraine. I think it's incredibly important that Ukraine is able to keep their, uh, just keep their, their sovereignty and their country and they don't allow Russia to take over. Because what Russia is doing is Russia was super smart when it came with energy. Russia was the only one that actually allowed the pipeline to come through, which means they were able to take oil and produce gas. I don't know if you remember, but the very first thing Biden did was he destroyed the Keystone Pipeline. A lot of people thought that was great for the environment, but the trickle effect of that is that Americans are no longer energy independent. We were producing more gasoline before then uh, than ever before, and we were energy uh, we were energy dependent, and we have now crippled our country by depending on other people for oil and gas. And OPEC is is definitely we're going to talk about that in a minute. But so Russia has put themselves in a very good situation when it comes to power and energy because they just had policies where they have, they have gasoline to sell people. So we keep hearing on the news about recessions. And I want to tell you that we are in a technical recession. So what a recession actually is, is year over year, 
they can, so we have four quarters. So first quarter, second quarter, third quarter, and fourth quarter each year, January to March, April to June, July to September, and then October to December. And so what they do is they take this basket of goods. They'll take milk, eggs, steak, lumber. Uh, they have this whole item of, of, of goods, and they say, okay, what did it sell first quarter of 2021, and what is it selling first quarter of 2022? And then they'll do the same thing. What's selling second quarter of 2021? What's selling second quarter of 2022? And so that is what's actually happening and why we are in a recession is because it's going down as far as our gross domestic product, like what we're actually expending and producing into the world. Um, it is a technical recession. A lot of people hear recession and they think 2008, 2009. And we're not at all there. And I've got graphs to show you on that. Uh, but how recessions do happen is monetary policy tightening, right? That's why everybody's talking about the Fed. That's literally what is happening right now. So the Fed, Federal Reserve, Jerome Powell, is sitting there raising how much it costs to borrow money. And, and they do this in order to stop inflation because it was growing so quickly. But we're in this bubble of strange economic times due to the pandemic. Uh, so right now we do have monetary policy tightening, which is absolutely causing the recession. Um, then we also have overborrowing and heavy investment. We have fiscal policy shocks, which we definitely had last year. You know, when you were receiving those checks uh, from the federal government, it felt great, right? It felt like Christmas, you know? You're like, just free money. Uh, but the pain was gonna either come then or it's coming now, and, and it is coming now. Uh, and then we have financial sector dysfunction. So long-term concerns. The impacts of slowdown in China. Um, if you're not aware, China has a zero policy COVID, uh, or zero policy COVID just as soon as one person gets COVID in a community, they shut the entire community down. Most of China is manufacturing, uh, and so it is causing and you know causing havoc with supply chains. And we're having to look to other countries to um, basically get that supply. You know, we're looking at Taiwan, we're just looking anywhere else that can produce the same types of things that China was producing. But that is a long-term global concern because they do produce so many goods that Americans actually consume and they consume American goods but hard to do when you can't leave your house. So we have a new axle of evil. It's Russia, China, and Iran. Um, these countries are not countries that are our friends. They are not doing things with their policy uh, in order to help democracy and globalization. Uh, our mortgage finance system, we're, we're hurting. You know, when, when the federal, when, when the Fed raises interest rates, um, re really they don't raise interest rates as much as the mortgage system bases the interest rates on inflation. And so with the pandemic and the numbers that are coming through, I mean, housing's up almost 20% year over year, and that is due to lack of supply and excessive demand. And so, you know, the mortgage finance system is struggling because there's less and less people who can afford, sorry, it's my dog, Sam, stop. <laughs> there's less and less people who can afford the higher interest rates. We're at 7%. Starting November 2nd, we're going to be at uh, probably three quarters to a full point higher than we are right now, um, which means, to put it in perspective, if you're getting a $500,000 loan, every time our interest rates go up by one point, you're spending $386 more a month. So what's happening is less and less people can just get on that affordability track. You know, there, there's not as many people with as much money the lower priced homes are definitely doing better. More people can afford them. 
But as you get higher in price and you have to borrow money, it gets more and more expensive. Uh, deficit spending, while I completely agree with what we're doing in order to support uh, Ukraine, um, we've given them $40 billion, we need to do that just from a global perspective and, and keeping freedom. Uh, I think it's very important that Russia does not overtake Ukraine, but we're spending lots of money and we printed lots of money. And that's why you're feeling it in the grocery stores and at the gas tank and everywhere else you look. Uh, and then what is really affecting, you know, when they're printing all that money, I understand why the government felt like they needed to do it. We had people who were unable to work. We told people they couldn't run their businesses. Uh, and so what really ended up happening was we just made the spread of income inequality even worse. So now people who have money are doing way better and there's a lot more people who are not doing well and we are quickly losing our middle class. And you know, all of these are huge long-term concerns that I see, uh, especially in about 10 years. Russia and France and our energy crisis. Already touched on this a little bit. Uh, Russia is doing great with oil production. Russia is also a part of OPEC. OPEC has decided that they want to see gasoline at $100 a barrel. We're currently at about 85, uh, which just means gasoline is going to get more expensive. France is super interesting. Let's look at this map. This is the most used energy sources in Europe. France is the only country they use the most nuclear out of any of us. That's important. If we're not talking about nuclear energy, we're not really talking. We need to figure out a way to harness nuclear energy in a safe and productive way where we're not so dependent on oil. I know everybody thinks solar and wind and all, all of these things are super important, but from a long-term stance, if we can create independency for the world through nuclear energy, this is something we all should be focused on. So Spain is still, and Portugal is still heavy on oil. Uh, we've got Italy, who focuses more on natural gas along with England. But so when you see these blue countries, these countries are the ones that are really going to get hurt by Russia's control over how much oil they're producing and how much oil those countries are actually getting. So the risk of recession. There's always a recession coming, right? So like the, the economy goes like this. It just goes up, down, up, down. And so in the last five recessions, um, a lot of people don't realize, you know, when you hear recession, you think everything goes down. It's not true. Uh, the housing in Denver only went down once, and that was in the 2008-2009 bubble. Um, but there's always a risk of it. And so high inflation and higher interest rates are precursors to the next recession, right? Ta-da, we're here. We have high interest rates and we have high inflation. So gasoline prices. OPEC is actually cutting how much oil they're producing. So, you know, in, a, in America, in a single day, uh, we go through 20 million barrels of oil per day. OPEC wants to cut that uh, by about 2%. OPEC wants uh, gasoline to be selling at $100 a barrel. And that is not currently happening. We're at 85, so you're going to see gasoline prices increasing. And what happens when gasoline prices increase? Everything else costs more money, right? It costs more money for you to take a box of oranges from Florida and put them in a truck and bring them up here to Colorado and all of that costs more money and that's why we're feeling it at the stores too. One of the reasons is because gasoline is getting more expensive and OPEC has no interest in changing that. So you're not going to see a lot of help at the gasoline pump uh, and there's really not a lot we can do about it. So United States and our updates. 
I am still seeing that this decade is still going to be a decade of growth. There's a lot of appreciation to have in this decade. I still see a brick wall in 2030. We're going to have ups and downs, like we're going to go through this little recession uh, where it's occurring right now. Um, we'll kind of go through it in 2023, and then we're going to see it shift. Uh, I think 2024 is going to be an incredible economic year on almost every economic level. So if you're watching this and you're in another industry, whether it's cars or whatever, uh, 2024 should be a banner year, and you want to make sure you're ready for that. You know, if you're a business owner and you're thinking about supply or how am I going to produce thing, things, you don't want to be too heavy on the front end, but you need to be ready to deliver by 2024 because the, the economy will be doing quite well at that point. Um, the reason why I still think we're going to have a major issue in 2030 is our demographics, so our aging population, uh, our healthcare is, is excellent, however, we're keeping people too long at the party. The average American spends 98% of their medical bills, their costs, like what they've actually spent in, a in their lifetime in the last two years of their life. And we need to start asking ourselves, it's a hard question, but what's the line? You know, does it make sense to be replacing a 90-year-old with a new hip? I know it sounds cold, but at the same time, uh, we have to look at our demographics and we have to understand where our energy is going and what we're putting into it. Uh, entitlements, right? I had three kids and I'm, I'm, I'm not going to work and I need somebody to pay for my housing and my health care and my food. We need to be watching that. You know, when Americans first came to America, when we left England, you did not have a choice, but you had to work. There were not entitlement programs, and that really allowed our country to grow. But the more entitlement programs we have, the more the country goes backwards, and we need to be very careful of that. Inflation is obviously an issue, and we're going to go more into why inflation occurred. Um, in the U.S. national debt, you know, the U.S. national debt's not getting better, and we're not helping it at all. Uh, as that gets worse, you know, the government basically owes money, and people buy bonds, and they buy money from, or give money, America, to money, and then we have to pay them back. And our national debt is really crippling. Uh, you know, it's so much money we're having to spend in order to pay our debts and not default. And that's one of the reasons why we're having to print so much money. Let's talk food. I don't know if you've noticed in the grocery store, but I'm pretty unimpressed with our produce. Uh, even if you go to really nice stores like Whole Foods or Mars X, um, the, the thing you need to start learning about food is that there's two different types of food that we're able to purchase at a store. There's food that's actually grown from the dirt. And that is the best kind of food you can get. Then there's really beautiful food. And like, I don't know if you've been to Costco and seen those gorgeous peppers. Those are hydroponic. So the difference on the food front is hydroponics are grown in water. And so what happens when food is grown in the ground is that that plant actually eats carbon that's in our atmosphere and it goes down and it goes down into the roots and into the ground. And this is a really good thing for environmental reasons, right? I think if you're not concerned about the environment, you're not paying attention. But the, the new wave to feed people is vertical. You can see uh, these pieces that they're building and they're all electric and they're all water and they're hundreds of feet up in the air and our food is being grown hydroponically which means it's not eating the carbon which means the food you're getting is not as nutritious and this is a real concern uh, you know I've always had issues with you know meat that is in processing facilities uh, I'm a big believer in 
getting your meat from local ranchers, uh, support the local economy. Uh, and, you know, I, I read just recently a, a fantastic book that really uh, helps understand what is happening with food. It's a Barbara Kingsolver, Animal, Animal Vegetable Miracle. And she spends uh, one year with her family and makes a pact with her family that they would not eat anything that was not within 100 miles of their farm, minus olive oil and coffee. And so for that year, they produced their own food on this little farm they had in Virginia. They bought all locally, and it's about their adventure through it. But it's fascinating. Uh, one of the really interesting stats was Americans, we export 1.35 tons of billions of potatoes, but we import 1.25 tons of billions of potatoes. And what that actually does to the environment is atrocious. You sit there and you take all these potatoes and you're sending it overseas, which is weight, which is boats, which is oil, which is causing environmental issues. You're taking this food, you're traveling it to other countries. And all that time it's been out of the earth it starts to diminish in its natural ability uh, for nutrients. So the longer it sits in boxes, the longer it's traveling, it's less and less nutritious. And so my challenge for people when I meet them and I'm talking to them about food is buy local. And if I just see a little sticker saying made in the USA, I'm like great. Where, but I'm not buying uh, vegetables that are out of this country that have had to go across oceans. I am very much supporting our local farmers, uh, buying as much local and, and, and farm food as possible, growing as much food as possible. Our, our food is very much so getting sprayed with pesticides. It is not healthy, uh, and I think the long-term health effects are going to be devastating and one of the reasons why we're going to hit a brick wall in 2030. Water shortages. It's scary to think about. You know, water is a, it's, it's something that we cannot live without, right? We have to have water. We're made of water. Uh, our animals need water. And, you know, this also kind of goes into entitlements, but, you know, with water rights, China's buying up water rights all over. If you're not worried about water, you're not paying attention. And, you know, Colorado is healthy in water, but we also feed five other states. And I don't know that we can get away with that. When we give Arizona all of their water, Arizona's a desert. You start thinking about how much we have to share our water with, and it does get concerning. Rising gas prices. I already talked a little bit about OPEC. You know, some weeks are better than others. Uh, it's always great when gas is under $4 a gallon. I don't see that long term. OPEC is uh, wanting more money, and you're going to see it over $4 a gallon, at least here in Colorado, I think, within three weeks. So supply and demand. Everything we're going to talk about really has to do with supply and demand. So if you look at uh, 2008, when the market just crashed, we had over 27,000 active listings in uh, the Denver metro. We have under 2,000 right now. So supply is super important because as you get more and more supply, there's less and less demand, right? If you go to the grocery store and there's 50 apples to choose from and you only need two, you, know, you can go through and pick out your apples and move on. But I mean, I remember, you know, in the heart of the pandemic when everything was closed down, you know, going to the store and our, our shelves were empty and, you know, there'd be one box and people were rushing to get it, you know, of rice or whatever. And so supply and demand are key factors when you're looking at what's going on economically. Same with oil, right? OPEC wants the price of oil to go up. So what they're going to do is decrease the supply. 
And so that's kind of the, that's the crux and that's the one thing you have to understand when you're really looking at economics. And especially when you're looking at housing, right? Supply and demand. You know, people are calling me going, oh my gosh, we're gonna have a huge recession. Like, is this my chance to pick up a bunch of houses? And we'll talk about that, but uh, no, <laughs> we're not quite there. So home buying. Obviously I'm in real estate. I follow the economy very closely because I am in real estate. Then I wanna help people make good decisions when it comes to uh, their long-term financial wealth and their health. So this is the change in FHA, FHA state housing prices index, seasonally adjusted. So this is for second quarter of 2022. Uh, our state was 19th. So quarter over quarter for second quarter, 2022 to 2021, uh, Colorado was up 2.83%. If you look, I'm sorry, that's first quarter. So if you look at first quarter to second quarter, so let's make this simple. You bought a house January 1st, 2022. By March 1st, 2022, if you bought that house for $100,000, in March it was worth $102.36. If you look year over year, Colorado was up 17.66%. That's in one year. Uh, the Denver was up 19.8%, uh, Denver proper. Um, if you look at five years, real estate's up 70.85%. And if you look all the way back to 1991, housing's up 596%. So there's lots of people who are like, oh, you shouldn't own real estate, just be in the stock market. Real estate outperforms the stock market and is more consistent and is safer because I don't need stock in you know, these companies, but everybody needs a house over their head. It is one of the basic needs for life and for living, and, and that's something I'm always a big believer in having. So five ways to become wealthy in the US. Uh, you can inherit it, or you can marry it. Great on you if you get either of these, or even better, both. Um, so if you have a rich uncle, or a sugar you know, mama, or somebody like that, that is one way to create wealth uh, in America. Number two, play the stock market. You know, I have a co-agent um, that I'm coached with who lives in Arizona. And about 10 years ago, he put a million dollars into Tesla. And he sold it a couple years ago for $11 million. Sometimes you can make that really, you know, awesome investment and you get the turnaround, but it's risky and it's time consuming. Uh, the third way to become wealthy, you can create a business, own a business. It's super risky. 20% uh, of businesses fail within the first five years. Half of all businesses fail within the first, uh, I'm sorry, 20% fail in the first year, and then 50% fail in the first five years. It's hard to run a business. You have to have many different hats. You have to understand the economics, you have to understand the emotional, you have to understand your employees, you have to understand supply. I think it's wonderful. I'm pro starting businesses. 70% of all our people in Colorado actually are employed by small business owners, uh, but it's risky. Number four, you can become a Bronco player or you can be a fantastic entertainer or you can win the lottery. It's um, incredibly rare, and uh, you know. But if you can do it, good for you. But I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't bank on it. Uh, fifth is own real estate. It's the most common way a person can gain wealth. Over ninety percent of all of our millionaires in America became millionaires through owning real estate. So five reasons people are not homeowners. When, uh, when people were asked why they were not homeowners, these were the five big reasons. They didn't have enough information. They thought it was too scary of a process. They were overwhelmed with where to start. They didn't think they had enough credit. 
and they didn't think they had the income. And it's one of those things where, unless you're living with mom and dad, uh, you're gonna pay for housing. And you have to decide if you're gonna pay someone else for your housing or if you're gonna pay yourself. Right now, with interest rates the way they are, I'm telling people, marry the house, date your interest rate, and divorce renting. Uh, renting is up year over year 17.6% in Denver Metro, which means if you paid $1,000 for your studio last year, you're paying 1017 this year. 17% gets higher and higher. I have people who are renting who call me and you know, are so upset because their rent just went up five, seven, a thousand dollars. That's real income. And, 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 and that is taking money away from the economy because it's money that you know these, these tenants are not able to go spend out at grocery stores or the mall or you know eating out. And, and that's literally 70% of our economy is consumer spending. So you know that's the real danger of renting. So inability, instability of rent. So rent prices have hit record highs. And you kind of need to understand what's happening with housing. So this all actually goes all the way back to 2008. Uh, when 2008, when people realized we were having problems, uh, and we really slowed down. Denver uh, housing prices went down 25% from 2008 to 2010. This is not a normal recession. This is what's called a great recession. But what ended up happening was builders got burned. New housing startups, um, they completely diminished. And so what ended up happening starting in 2008 is we already had a supply issue, right? Not enough housing. And builders quit building for years. They didn't really start building again until 2012, and even then it wasn't enough. So rents are increasing because there's not enough housing. So as supply decreases and demand increases, things get more expensive. There's not any security in renting. You know, you get short notice to come up with first month, last month, and security deposit. Uh, you're moving costs. You have to take time out of work to move. Uh, you know, kids, keeping kids in school districts. Sometimes there can be a struggle to try to find a place in short notice just to keep kids in the same school district. And that can get really expensive if you're renting and not owning. So instability of renting, renewing a lease. You know, you go to renew your lease nowadays and everybody's asking for more money. Property taxes are up. Insurance is up. Everything's up. So of course your rent's going up. Um, finding a new home quickly. You don't have any control over the home. You know, for landlords, you're dependent on them making repairs. I've heard some horror stories from people who are renting and the landlord is not fixing things in a timely manner. And it's stressful to rent. You never know when that lease is up what's going to happen. So another reason why we're not going to have a major housing recession. This is 2007. We peaked for active inventory at 3.7 million. Our average is 2.5 million. This is across America. We're currently at 870,000. This is why real estate's not going to fall down. But I will tell you what's going to happen over the next six months, which is going to be interesting. COVID also greatly affected uh, the, the housing starts. So this is total units, privately owned housing units. This is 2020. We were building houses. We needed to build houses. And then everything shut down and it went down to what, about 900 units? <laughs> uh, yeah, it's, it's across America and it's not enough. And so we've had about two years of major slowdowns in housing starts, which is again, creating a supply and demand issue. Not enough supply, 
more demand. Rising interest rates, and I mean, this is already, you know, I did this about a month ago, and we're already at, at you know, ju just under 7%, so we're even higher. Uh, so this is U.S. conventional 30-year mortgage rates. Mortgage rates um, have been built into more of a target rate increase and are partially making up for the artificially low COVID level. So what's happening is red is the mortgage rates, the target rates are the blue. We're targeting 2.5, we're at 5.22. We needed to raise mortgage rates in order to tap down inflation. It's not feasible to have a 20% increase year over year on housing. That will cause us to hit a brick wall. So the increase in mortgage rates was smart, but it's also causing even more of uh, equality between all of the people who are living in America as far as income. So this is why it's not sustainable. So your blue income price, this dark blue, it's now matched with the sales price. So your personal income has been going up. People are paying more. I did a round of increases for my employees. I need to do more. Uh, I am struggling with finding the money to pay people more money. And so, you know, you're sitting or looking at this, the sales price has now hit our income our personal income. And so what this is gonna tell you is, you're not gonna see 20% increase in your home. Uh, I believe over the next 12 months, you're gonna see about a 4% increase. You're not gonna see a decrease. There's not gonna be an under, like less, you know, a, a negative disinflation, like that is not happening. Uh, and it's simple economics. You know, lumber costs more, gasoline costs more, employees, construction workers, I mean, everything is costing more money. So it costs more money to build the house, so you're not gonna see housing fall, but what you are gonna see is that this housing price increase is not gonna be sustainable long-term, and we're gonna start seeing a more gradual increase in housing instead of the shoot up, which I think is good. So household income needed to afford an average home. This is across America. Uh, Colorado is not terribly affordable. Your family income needs to be $123,000 in order to afford an average home. Single family home last year was $687,000 in Denver. So you can go other places, like Wyoming, you only need a household income of $67,000 and change. But do you want to live in Wyoming or do you want to live in Colorado? A lot of this comes down to quality of life. Uh, so, you know, dual income is so important. Uh, you know, if you're really liking your boyfriend or girlfriend, you might want to get married. You're going to be able to build wealth. You can buy things together. Uh, I'm seeing family members buy together, uh, cousins buying homes together. It's smart. You can buy it together, especially if you can get a two bed, two bath, and you each have a portion of the home, and you guys can start building wealth together. Even though there's still affordable housing out there. I mean, there are condos out there for under $200,000, which is a very affordable level um, in Denver uh, to own and, and to stop renting and start paying yourself. Home prices through normal recessions. So the, this blue line, right? Here we are back in 1991. We, we went through 2001 recession, real estate still went up. We were in a 90 uh, dot com recession, real estate still went up. It only really went down with the uh, unscrupulous lending practices that we had back in 07, which, you know, which created 2008, 2009. So here you saw it go down. And now it's back on its way up. Uh, the, the reality is our industrial production index, it doesn't match exactly the home price, but it's coming up closer to existing median home prices and the US industrial production index. And if you watch the US industrial production index, that'll help you forecast 
what is happening economically and with with housing and, and many other things. So homes are, let's see, the blue line is your 12 month over over home price dollars, right? So here it is from 1990, went up, 2007 it went down, and now it's been going up. The green line is the stock market. So it has been going, it's, it, it went down, I mean everybody's felt that, right? And everybody's stocks are down. Real estate's still up, stocks are down. You know, if you, if you really look at this, you know, real estate is a better store of value long term than the stock market. I am not saying you should not be in the stock market. I think you need to have a collective basket of uh, different asset classes in order to create wealth in America. But I can tell you, your number one job is to own a primary home. And I can tell you that people who retire with one other home besides their primary home retire 36 times more wealthy than people who do not. So if you don't have real estate in your portfolio, I would suggest getting real estate in your portfolio. So ITR, they are my favorite economics, the Boulier brothers. Uh, they wrote Prosperity in the Age of Decline. I'm a big fan of theirs. I think they're great. Uh, they, they are right on over 97% of every metric economically all the way back to 1980. Um, and so what they do is they create this graph and you can see where their thinkers and, and, and where everything is going. And so right now non-residential construction, so like commercial, it's actually on a growth phase. Green is good. There's not a lot of green right now. Consumer prices are kind of at the top. You're going to see a little bit going down. Everybody's talking about, like when, when you hear like CNBC, they'll talk about hard landing, and then they'll talk about soft landing. So this is the zero, this black line. If you go under the black line, that's deflation. If you stay on top, it means it's slowing growth. So housing's right here. Housing is slowed. Uh, you know, but my buyers right now that I have are grading great buys. Uh, homes that would have sold for 900000 in March of this year are selling for seven fifty right now. And it's because interest rates are high. But what you're going to find are the people who are purchasing houses during the soft landing, which for sure will be for another three to four months. Uh, they're going to get great buys for people who are not educated in understanding what's happening economically. Because what's going to happen is housing's going to have a soft landing and then it's going to ramp back up. And that ramping can happen as soon as second half of 2023, that will for sure be here in 2024. So if you're considering like you need to move up, um, what I'm telling people, if you could swing it, try to buy something now and then rent your place out for a year and then sell it. Fannie Mae Freddie Mac is saying that our interest rates should be back down to about 4.5% in March. I would love to believe them. Uh, I'm forecasting June. I think interest rates will be under 5% by June. And so what I'm telling people is find a house, get the best deal you possibly can. We're going we're gonna to refinance you probably within eight months. Uh, there is a thing called a 2 1 buy down, which I'm uh, definitely encouraging people to do. And I'm actually asking sellers to pay for it. And a lot of them are. Uh, and what they're doing is buying down the rate. So, 2 1 buy down, let's say just for easy math, you have a 30 year mortgage at 7%. If you do a 2 1 buy down, the first 12 months, your interest rate would be at 5%. Then, your second year, it'd be one point less, you'd be at 6%. Then after two years, you go back to your 7% rate. I'm just not seeing inflation continuing to increase the way it is. This has been a product of the printing of money and the pandemic. And so you're going to see uh, inflation get cut severely, I think in about six to eight months. And that will be a great time to refi because mortgage rates are gonna come down. 
So low inventory is fundamental in our favor for housing. So this is U.S. single housing starts um, for U.S. existing home inventory. So the green line is your inventory of housing. Your blue line are housing starts. And housing starts are basically builders that are submitting the uh, permit to the government in order to build. And so if you see this, it has completely plummeted and has gone under 2.25%. Builders are not confident. Builders are worried about the Fed. They're worried about interest rates. They're worried about rising costs. And, and it's all fair to be, to be fearful of. But what this is going to create is even more of a shortage in housing, more of a demand, and opportunity to really make some money in this decade by buying low, selling high. So U.S. single family housing units, permits by state, Colorado's down year over year, 18%. Everything's getting so expensive. What um, most builders, if they're doing anything, they're doing multi-unit starts. So if you can buy a single family house or a half duplex, I think that is gonna be your greatest appreciation, um, the best thing you can do. Although really, owning anything is gonna be better than renting because inflation will continue. And this is one of the really interesting things. Everybody's saying, housing's got so expensive, who can afford it? Well, we can. So this blue line is your mortgage rate monthly. This is back in 1980. So our debt service payments are the lowest. They have been 3.89% of our disposable personal income. America is earning money. We have savings. We're actually in a really good position. Uh, this is not everybody has their credit cards run up and they don't have any money and they're getting into these large payments they can't afford. And this is simple economics of the fact that our debt service payments are a very small portion of our disposable personal income, which bodes well for the economy. This is also very interesting. So this graph, this uh, light, light, light blue, kind of gray. Uh, th this is how many people, which is about 65% of everyone who is getting a loan um, from 2021 to 2022 has over a 760 credit score. That's A plus. It's good and it's bad. It's harder and harder to get a loan right now. You know, you need to have good credit. You need to have good income. There's some programs out there for different people. I'm happy to set you up with them, depending on what your situation is. But what this is telling you is people who are getting loans are economically secure. They pay their bills. They have great credit scores. Um, they're doing well. Uh, the blue is between 720 and 759. That's still really good. It's like... What is that? Like 82% of everybody who's getting a loan has a 720 FICO or higher. That's impressive. It's not easy to get great credit scores. But what this is telling you is that we do not have a lot of risk. You look back here in 06, before the recession, people were, I mean, they didn't even have a, like, it was, what, eight? A little over 20% of people had over a 760 FICO and they were getting loans. And so this is a really interesting graph to show you that um, basically it's harder to get a mortgage than it has been years prior. You have to have good credit and, uh, and, and that bodes well for not having default. Um, a very hot market begins to decelerate. So this is housing starts for multi-unit housing. So here's 08, and look at how it just completely dropped down between 2009-2010. Slowly started to increase as it's gone on, up, down, up, down. 
it's it's starting to slow down, but it's still above the zero mark. Um, but it's, it's decelerating. People are worried about what's going to happen in the future, but what you need to look at are the fundamentals. Households have money. Our unemployment is nothing. Uh, you know, we, if you want a job, there is a job. Um, you know, it's it's really more of a concern from the job standpoint of getting qualified people for those positions. And one of the reasons why you're going to continue to see inflated prices is take transportation. So you make something, and you have to get it delivered to the consumer. So let's just take oranges from Florida. Oranges get made, they need to be put on a truck, and then they need to be sent all over America. We have less and less truck drivers. Things are happening with automation. You know, if you're in your 20s and you're thinking, you know, transportation is an industry you'd like to get involved with, why would you get into trucking when we're having driverless cars? I mean, honestly, our truck drivers could be completely out of business in five to 10 years just through automation. And so that's gonna actually help us when it does get automated with reducing costs, but we are gonna have a short pain period of things just costing more to get them delivered. This is a super positive sign uh, about housing. So this is your multifamily housing vacancy in, in index. And this, is, this green line is your year over year. Um, the over 50 is your higher. We're at very low vacancy rates. And low vacancy rates is again that whole supply and demand thing. You know, if you have 100 units in an apartment complex and you only have two vacancies, you're not having a problem. You're, you're not dropping your rents. You're not you know, doing any of those things. And it's not going to start because our employment is there. If you want a job, you will be employed. And if you're willing to work, there's a job for you. Where back in 2008 wasn't the case. There were people pounding the pavement looking for work. That is no longer the case here. And so our vacancy rates are quite low. People are not having to move in with mom and dad. They can afford to live on their own. Uh, U.S. multifamily housing permits by state. So we we so the orange A is recovery. That's blue. So like Kentucky, Tennessee, West Virginia, North Dakota. B is accelerating growth. Nevada. Texas, Oklahoma. C is slowing growth. Colorado's in that slowing growth uh, standpoint. But you still look across our, our skies in Denver and you still see skyscrapers everywhere. So we're still the number one city for millennials to move to. Um, and you know the housing will continue, but they're not building so much that we're gonna end up having a bunch of vacancies and see housing going down. Um, this is Interesting. So this is housing starts and existing sales. And they tend to mirror one another um, because as housing starts, you know, as existing sales increase, so do housing starts. So here's 2022. Back in 2021, housing starts were going up. See the 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 dark blue is the existing, the light blue is housing starts. So housing starts were up about 15% along with sales, and now they're plummeting down. And they're plummeting down based off the federal government raising the Fed rates and then what's happening with inflation, so our interest rates are going up. And what you have to understand is, you know, when you're getting an interest rate of 7% opposed to 3%, that knocks a lot of people, you know, out of the market. A lot of people literally cannot afford to buy. So if you can afford to buy, even if it's even if it's a little baby place, get your foot in the door. You're going to build equity. You're going to be able to move up. You don't have to buy your dream house right now. You don't have to have 20% right now. You don't have to have unbelievable credit right now. 
there are options and programs out there for almost everybody. And so I would highly suggest that you stop running and you get into a home just to start building wealth. So looking ahead, top three takeaways. The housing market and overall economy are very different from the pre-Great Recession. We are not in 2008, 2009. We are in troubling times. Basically, Jerome Powell wants to see your house, your car, and everything we're buying. He wants to see everything go down 20%. So he just keeps raising interest rates, but he's too late to the party. This should have happened during COVID. We should not have had 3% interest rates in 2021. It was a misstep on our federal government. And you know the reality is, is we all get to eat the pain now. We see rising prices. You're gonna see a little bit of softening in the real estate prices, but only for people who are being forced to sell. You know, divorce happens, relocation happens. Uh, you know, people get pregnant and they need more space. You know, the world continues to move on and our bank accounts and our employment are telling us that the housing market's not gonna crash and you're gonna continue to see appreciation. You're just not gonna see 20% appreciation. Um, tracking regional patterns and market specific trends are going to be the key to the business cycle. Uh, so, you know, if you're in building and construction, there's a lot of growth in kind of the southeast sector of America. Um, Colorado's mid grade, even though we have all the millennials moving here, you know, we just had Hurricane Ian, and I had to go down and help my mother, who has a second home in Florida. And talking about the food and the fact that we're not growing food with our farmers and you know it, it, we need to be growing more in the dirt so it eats the carbon so we don't have the environmental effects but i will tell you long term coasts are going to get hurt by water and it's going to be environmental issues and you're going to see the mid states that are not um coastal you're going to see them do better and better because we're going to have less of environmental impact. The other thing you have to see is the increasing heat. So, you know, there, there's southern states. I mean, you can't live there without AC. And, you know, Arizona had, you know, 132 degree weather for days on end. Your AC goes out, you're dead. And so Colorado, because of our high elevation and because we're not on a coast, we're a very safe environmental state to own long term. Uh, and then, you know, rising interest rates are, are going to be key. So, so this is literally what I'm going to see. You're going to see interest rates keep going up this year. Housing, closings, um, and everything is going to slow down. You know, when you purchase a home, you end up getting furniture, you end up getting window coverings, you might go buy paint. Um, so you're going to see all of that slow down. You're, so you're going to see our economy slow down. You're going to see people buying less. That is going to bring down our inflation numbers. Doesn't mean it's going to go less than what it was in 2020. It just means that if you bought a bottle of water for a dollar, you know, quarter over quarter, it'll still probably be a dollar once interest rates are up around 10%. So when that happens, um, you're going to see kind of a pullback in our economy, which I'm already seeing, but the Fed's gonna quickly have to, to pivot. Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac is already saying they believe interest rates will be at four and a half percent by March. Um, I would love for that to be true. I just am not buying it. I do think it's gonna be a little bit longer, but I do see interest rates starting to go down February, March time period. This is not long for this world, this, these interest rates. So let's talk about Denver and our crime. Not a fun subject, but if you live in Denver and you live in Colorado, you need to be aware of what's happening with our city. So violent crime rates. Blue is the sum of the Colorado rate. See how we've shot up here since 2021? Orange is the sum of the US rate. Our violent crimes 
have skyrocketed. We were, you know, for years, we were well lower than the average U.S. crime. And then when it came up to about 2018, we got a little, we had a little peak, and then we completely shot up with our crime. I 100% blame our elected officials. I also blame Denver's sheriff. Uh, our elected officials are not putting criminals in jail. Uh, I know it's hard, we don't have as much space, but the reality is there are plenty of prisons that are empty and our people who are breaking the law need to spend real time in jail. Because what is happening is our violent crimes have shot up because people know that they can break the law here in our city and they are not gonna get caught. You call the police, they don't show up. And it's a reality that I am sure 99% of you, if you live here, know what's happening. People are getting jumped on the streets. People, our, our drug use is just out of control. You know, you, you see people doing heroin, you see people doing meth. You, it's, it, it's absolutely ridiculous and there's no consequence. So, you know, we sat there and we, we basically told our police during COVID that, you know, we, we didn't want them anymore. And, and we're paying for it greatly in our state. And it's something that really concerns me. I have a freshman at CU Boulder. I have a senior in high school. There are, I mean, last weekend, there were seven teenagers uh, that got shot. Uh, you know, the crimes are increasing and we need new political people. We need to not vote for our incumbents. I know we've got more time with Hancock, which is very disappointing. He has done a horrible job this quarter. Um, and I, I'm, it's not, I'm really not terribly political. I, I don't like anybody. <laughs> so I think all parties are bad. Um, you know, I think we need term limits and I think everybody needs to go out and vote because if we're not voting for the health and safety of Denver, we could lose our city. And these elections that are coming up over the next couple of years are going to be so important. We need leadership and we need to be focused on fixing our homeless problem and, and, and creating safety in our city for our children and our families. Here's an interesting stat, motor vehicle theft. So blue is US, right? Went down actually from 2008, our cars have gotten better. Here we are in Colorado. Do, do, do. Shot up in 2014. Oh, flat, flat, flat. 2019, 2020. 2020, it shot up. My marketing director has had his vehicle stolen three times. The people who are stealing cars, apparently, if it's under $2,000, it's only a misdemeanor, but they're not putting people in jail. So my marketing director has had his car stolen three times. There's not been a single person that's been arrested. There's no one who's spent any time in jail. And, you know, these numbers are crazy. Look at, we're 723% higher since 2021 for car theft. So if this isn't making you realize how important it is that we get some people in office that care about the safety of our community, you know, these are the things we need to be worried about. And you need to be safe when you're walking around, you know? I mean, you, sh you should carry mace in your purse. I mean, you should be ready. And, and you know, there's certain vehicles that are getting stolen more than others, but we need to have, uh, you know, consequences for breaking the law. Our fentanyl problem, just in Denver, yay. 2018, it started going up. By 20, we're at, 912 deaths per year for fentanyl. Fentanyl is a real problem. Uh, you know, foreign countries are literally trying to kill our kids and kill us. They're selling pills online that are, are literally killing college students, and it's because of fentanyl. We need to have a hard stance against fentanyl. If you get caught dealing fentanyl, if you have fentanyl in your home, I think it should be an automatic jail time, jail sentence. This is a serious problem that families are dealing with. Families are losing family members. 
thinking they're doing something else and it's actually laced with fentanyl and they're dying. And this is a real issue. And I am not, I am so pro Denver. I love Denver more than anything. I just want to educate people though on what's happening in the city. We have to focus on safety and it's safety for everybody. It's all of us. It's, it's homeowners, it's renters. It's also people who are living on the street. It's not safe for those people to be on the street. There need to be facilities for these people and we need to make it illegal to sleep on the streets because this problem is not gonna go away unless we start doing something. So the impact of inflation. What is inflation? So basically, inflation is the diminishing of the, of the dollar that you've earned over time. Things get more expensive. Uh, so this bottle of water, if it cost a dollar last year, it now costs a dollar and 19 cents this year. That was our inflation number. So what is it exactly and how does it affect us? What is inflation we have? It? What causes it? Inflation is caused by a supply and demand issue, which we 100% had because of the pandemic. We told people they couldn't work. We stopped producing things. There were more people that wanted to purchase things and we didn't have them available. The other thing that causes inflation is the printing of money. Did you know that 35% of all the money in America was printed in the last 11 months? Think about that. 35% of every dollar in circulation was printed in the last 11 months. What does that do? That diminishes you and your past work time. So if you were paid a certain salary last year, by the fact that they're printing this much money, it's making what you did last year, it's diminishing the value of your work. And so how does this affect you? It affects you everywhere. It affects your energy bill, it affects your food bill, it affects your gas price, it affects your insurance, it affects your housing, it affects taxes, you name it. Um, does it affect real estate? 100%. You know, lumber's up over 600%. Concrete, all the things it takes to build houses. What you have to look at is, am I able to build that house for less than what I can purchase it for? And right now you can't. And that's why I'm still bullish on housing. Um, what do you need to know? As far as inflation, you need to understand that hard assets are what you need. During inflationary times, you do not want to be heavy in cash. And I will tell you, whatever the media tells you to do, do the opposite. I've done very well through the years by doing exactly what the media tells you not to do. I think it's a great time to be getting invested in the stock market. I think it's a great time to be buying housing. Uh, and, and you know, you need to start looking at multiple sources of income streams, not just the one income stream, to really kind of ride out this decade. But this decade can be a great decade to earn a lot of money and uh, save a lot of money and get ready for when we do have our crash, which will occur sometime after 2030. 2030 right after. Uh, it'll be a great opportunity. We'll, literally, people will be able to build wealth. There'll be all new uh, Rockefellers you know, in, in America during that time. So I already did the definition. Inflation is the decline of purchasing power of a currency over time. And inflation's on the rise. <coughs> so global inflation is forecasted to rise to 8.8% .8 in 2022. So basically, if you were looking January for, well, let's do December 31st of 2021 to December 31st of 2022, $1 in 2021, in 2022, it's gonna be worth 108.80. That's the easiest way to, to understand it. In 2021, we had 4.7% inflation. I really believe that, that the only reason that number wasn't bigger was because we didn't have enough supply. 
there weren't enough things to buy. So, um, and then, so they do believe that our 8.8% forecast in 2022 is going to decline to 6.5% in 2023. So basically, if you buy a house for 100,000 end of this year, next year in 2023, that same $100,000 house will cost you 104,700 bucks, not including natural appreciation. If you look at the numbers in Denver proper, from 1970 to 2020, we had natural appreciation of 6.8% on single family homes, 5.7% on condos. Inflation versus deflation, what's the difference? Well, we're not having deflation. Deflation means in 2022, you know, the, the prices would be less than 2020. It's not happening. And it's because gasoline is going to stay high. Uh, wages are increasing. Everything's increasing. So, you know, the media tries to give you these you know, these lines and these headers, just so you'll like, it's clickbait, right? What can I read? What can I read? And everybody wants information. But the reality is, we just need the inflation to slow down. The federal government's job is to have inflation at 2%, and we're running hot. And so I do agree with the rising of interest rates, but we're going to feel it a lot sooner than I think anybody realizes. And I do see mortgage rates going down next year, and then we're going to start a whole nother frenzy. So, you know, when interest rates get back down to four and a half percent, we're going to triple how many people can afford to buy a house. There's going to be more competition, uh, and it, it's it's going to be harder to get a home. Where right now, you have a lot of choice. Uh, you know, there's houses are spending a lot more time on the market. Um, you know, they're not going the first weekend unless they're completely cream puff properties and they're priced perfectly in order to get multiple bids. Uh, so you're going to see price reductions and really a great opportunity to own real estate. Um, the expansion of the money supply is the biggest reason for the inflation. How much did they really print? This is $1, $2, $5, $10, $20. This is how many more? But if you look at the total, so here in 2025, that's by billions of dollars. So in 2021, we printed $13 trillion. And we've printed even more this year. 35% of all the dollars were printed in the last 10 months. That was a few weeks ago and I did the chart, so it's really been about 11 months. But look at how much money, money we have printed since 2020. It's crazy. And that's why everything costs more. So how do we measure inflation? So the Consumer Price Index for Urban Consumers, um, the latest headline, that was 8.26%. The blue line is your consumer price. So it's CPI is the Consumer Price Index, and you have to be careful with this particular uh, thing because they'll, the government will sit there and take CPI, and they'll say, okay, whoa, filet mignon went up way too much. Let's use ground beef. And so they're always changing the Consumer Price Index, but this is literally how you measure inflation. And look how much inflation we've had. You know, your green line is where we want to be. This is your target. And this is how much has, has happened. And I understand there's you know, multiple effects of why, but we do need to bring it down, and that's why interest rates are where they're at. Inflation through history. We had our largest inflation between 1913 and 1919. Um, you know, it was, it, if you go through each decade, we are closer to 1970s styles. Um, for each decade, and this is you know throughout history and the years, it's not that high, but we're really having high rates right now, and that's well again what happened in the 70s. What we went off the gold supply, so we used to only be able to print as much money as there was gold. So that's why we had such high inflation. Now we have such high inflation, and it's happening. And this is early, right? So I mean, this is only 2020 at 1.78 percent. 
So we're having inflation because we're printing way too much money. So this is a closer look at 70s. So this is 1970 to 1979. Um, from the average annual inflation by decade chart, we can see that the average inflation for the 1970s was about 7.25%. Housing alone last year was 19%. Hard assets is what you want right now. And a cumulative look, we're at 10% 10, 10 from 2010 to 2015. This is per decade. 70s were the worst. I think when, by the time we hit 2030, you're going to see that number be very similar. Home prices in the 70s. So these are home prices from 2016 to 2026. Percent increase. 4%, 5%, 9%, 9%, 9%. This is over the U.S. median housing. By 2026, the median house will be 708,000. Right now, it's 501,000. Well, it's very similar if you come over here to the inflation rate and home prices of the 70s and starting to go into the 80s. It's about 9%. It averages from 1973 to 1982. This is 2016 to 2026, it's averaging out about 9%. So it's, it's not going anywhere, it's here to stay. Average home prices. Average home price in the U.S. in 1970 was 17,000. In 1980, it was 47,200. 1990, it was 79,100. In 2000, it was 119,000. Don't you all wish we could buy a house for that much? It's you know 22 years later, and average single-family house last year in Denver, Colorado, was 687. And so this is just historic, and these are home prices through the decades, how they've increased. Again, this was our major financial recession, which we are not in. That was the housing bubble that was artificial, and we're just not there. It's simple supply and demand economics. Rents and inflation. Average rents in the U.S. in 1970, $108. By 2000, it was $602. Rents increased 17% in Denver Metro in the last 12 months. If you're a landlord, you're doing well. We don't have enough supply, uh, and we need more housing, and builders aren't building. So you've got a, a, a perfect storm of you know, a supply and demand issue for housing, and you can capitalize on this. How do they stop inflation? They increase interest rates. There's less buyers, less people can afford stuff. This is how it works. And how does that stop? When interest rates get high, people decide they're going to stay at home, they're going to fix up their home, and they're going to save more money. So it encourages savings, which, what does savings do? It takes money out of the market, right? And it gets it out of circulation. And, and that's what they're looking for. They printed so much money, we have too much money in circulation, which is making everything more expensive. If people start saving more money, there'll be less money in circulation, and that will stop inflation. Inflation over time. If in 1930, 13, you purchased an item for $1,000, then in 2021, if you had that exact same item, it would be worth $28,161. So the cumulative rate of inflation is 2,716%. Hard assets is a good way to be. I think that's it. That's the end of my Denvernomics. So I know it's a lot of information to look at. Um, I, I, I don't want you to not have any savings, but I want you to be strategic in what you're doing with your finances, what you're purchasing, what you're investing in. Um, I, I think housing is a great way to go. Multi-units are a great way to go. Colorado still has 2.2 dogs per household. Having rentals with yards is smart. You, you can charge pet rent. Um, and, you know, it, it's interesting. I've had clients move thinking it would be cheaper in other states, but between property taxes and insurance, Colorado is still a fairly affordable place to live. Our prices are more expensive, but when you look at our monthly, insurance and taxes are low here, and, and that actually creates a lower monthly cost savings. 
I want you to be really thinking about the food you're getting. Really think about what you're getting at the grocery store. Help the environment. Make sure things are local. Buy local. Buy at farmer's markets. Buy food that's been in the ground. You will be healthier. I uh, hope all of this helped. If you have any questions, please reach out. I'm always help, happy to uh, answer any questions you might have. Have a good day.